Well, welcome everyone. Um, this is the penultimate of our uh, 14th season of uh, Archaeology Cafes. So seven out of uh, number eight uh, will be next month. And as people I think are well aware by now, we've been on <clears throat> virtual or online this entire season. So it's really let us bring our staff uh, to the table like uh, Josh is tonight and share the many ways in which we do preservation archaeology, implement that preservation archaeology mission. And uh, I think tonight you're going to see one more sort of element of the broad um, <clears throat> range of things that we do as preservation archaeologists. And Archaeology Southwest and Linda and Josh are in our Tucson office, uh, downtown Tucson which is the traditional territory of the Taunatum Nation. However, today I am in Newtown, Pennsylvania, a little bit north of Philadelphia. And that is the ancestral homeland and traditional territory of the, <clears throat> the Lenape uh, uh, indigenous peoples. And I encourage everyone to just, wherever you may be tonight, um, Take a moment and reflect upon and honor the native peoples <clears throat> whose traditional lands surround where you are tonight. I also want to ask or add some thanks um, <clears throat> to our sponsors, the Smith Living Trust. Uh, this is a sponsored um, offering uh, by Archaeology Southwest, and uh, it's with great uh, gratitude that we <clears throat> recognize the Smith family. And Josh is um, <clears throat> obviously our speaker tonight. We've referred to him many times already. Um, he earned his, PhD, earned his PhD from ASU in 2013. Uh, he's, he deserves the label of Ho'okam archaeologist by the places he's worked and the things he's, he's studied. Um, and he's, while well, he had a volunteer uh, session uh, back in 1998 um, at, with Archaeology Southwest, even before we became Archaeology Southwest, we were the Center for Desert Archaeology back in those days. Um, he escaped for a while, but we um, brought him back. He's at, now in his third year um, here at Archaeology Southwest, uh, early in that third year. And he's the database manager for Cyber Southwest. And I just want to reiterate one more time. I pointed it out last time that we are amazingly ecumenical when we balance people from ASU and, and U of A. Um, and it's, it's actually, um, if you get us off the basketball and other kind of athletic uh, endeavors, um, the collaboration and the synergy of, of working together has been uh, just wonderful over many, many long years. So we're ha happy to have um, Josh on board. And tonight, we kind of kicked this topic around a little bit with, with Scott Ingram um, and Karen Schulmeyer last time on how wonderful um, large databases are for um, preservation archaeology research. So Josh is going to take on the question of what is Cyper Southwest, uh, the potential of massive databases for future preservation archaeology research. And <clears throat> I'm going to go <clears throat> rest my voice and let J Josh use his for the next uh, 40 minutes or so. And we'll be back. All right. Well, um, thanks for that, Bill and Linda. and. And really, the thanks to all of you in the audience sort of fighting that Zoom burnout and tuning in for these things after a year of doing basically everything virtual. Um, maybe start out with a short informal story, just explaining a little bit about where my head is now. Um, this morning, I logged on to Facebook and shared the announcement about this archaeology cafe. Um, and I shared it with some fairly specific instructions, asking my friends to sign up for this. But please don't let me know you signed up so that I don't freak out and get nervous. Um, and uh, 
you know, as you would expect, about 15 minutes later, I started getting screenshots from friends who were confirming that um, they were going to attend the cafe. So um, maybe I can take that as um, people aren't as exhausted um, with these virtual things as maybe I thought they were. Um, and then also just well played to my friends. Nice job. Um, but anyway, I'm going to go ahead and get started on this for real. And um, the place where I want to start is with a question. Um, and this is really a question for you all in the audience. And that is, what sorts of tools and data would you need to answer your questions about the ancient Southwest? Um, and really, if you're a professional, a student, or even just more casually interested, I'm asking you to think big. Um, of course, while I personally lean towards research, if it's more in your interest to think about other angles like site preservation or indigenous perspectives on archaeological resources, again, what tools would you need? Um, I'm going to count silently to 20 while you think about this question. Um, be honest, the dead air will be painful, but uh, just bear with me. So here we go, counting to 20. Okay, well, thanks for that. Um, Guess what I'd say is if you've got comments or questions, uh, feel free to fire them off to Linda if you want to. Um, I won't be able to see them during the presentation, but um, hopefully we can uh, work through some of this stuff at the end of the talk. Um, but mainly, and I just wanted to do this because what I'm talking about today, uh, Cyber Southwest, was born out of this kind of thought exercise. Um, this talk, and it's in a sense a lot like some of the other virtual archaeology cafes that we've had lately, um, it's an effort to pull back the curtain here at Archaeology Southwest. Um, it's more about what we're up to as opposed to highlighting specific research results. Um, so you've seen cafes, of course, this season on the whole spectrum. Um, but this, yeah, it's definitely more about how we do what we do and what the tools are. <clears throat> So here we go with apology number one of the night. And that's an apology for the lack of scenic shots of Southwest sites and landscapes. And really what you're gonna get tonight is mostly a mix of screenshots and figures and tables. Um, but um, it's consolation, here's a random pic of me near a site. Um, if that keeps you from signing off of Zoom for a little bit longer. Um, with that, um, you can maybe tell now, tell by now that I'm hoping to keep the tone of this presentation pretty light since, and let's face it, I'm mostly here to talk about a database and that's a big ask to make broadly interesting. And I mean, also, come on, it's hard to know sort of how well a joke has landed um, in this total silence of a Zoom webinar, so. Um, have a little patience with me, but anyway, um, really just need to get this out of the way. Um, Cyber Southwest is a website and an underlying database of archaeological data. Um, it's one of our public facing Archaeology Southwest products, and, and I really do mean public, as in if like you registered for this cafe, um, you're totally welcome and able to use Cyber Southwest. Um, it's a National Science Foundation supported project. Um, we're partnered with the University of Arizona, Arizona State University, and the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, we officially launched last summer, so back in June of 2020. Um, and yes, uh, we tend to lowercase the C in cyber for Cyber Southwest, um, borrowing some, say, just branding savvy um, from tech like your Apple iPhone or um, 
you know, sites like eBay. All right, so the app gateway looks like this. Um, when you hear me say app or application, um, simply just referring to the interactive part of the Cyber Southwest website. Um, it builds on past databases and NSF, National Science Foundation supported projects. Um, those are notably the Coalescent Communities Database and the Southwest Social Networks and Chaco Social Networks databases. Um, it's a living database. Um, it takes current and legacy data and integrates it with our system for new research and related uses. And so I also want to be as clear as possible about what Cyber Southwest isn't. Um, it is not an archaeological site database like many states and agencies maintain as an inventory of all known sites. But let's say just to briefly wrap up this part describing what Cyber Southwest is. Um, I mean, really, it's a set of important attributes that have been documented for some 21,000 archaeological sites. Um, attributes like ceramic data, uh, public architecture, the number of rooms, um, and the sources of obsidian artifacts are all important tools for gaining insights into cultural landscapes in large regions. Um, of course, the region that we're focused on is the Southwest US um, and Northwest Mexico. Um, importantly, uh, it is a guaranteed set of misinformation um, on the exact location of individual archaeological sites. Um, this is important. I'll follow up on it more later, um, but it's called geomasking. And it applies an algorithm to randomly move actual locations to inaccurate locations, um, but really sort of nearby in the grand scheme of things. Also, we've got that train going by again, so apologies for the horn. Um, anyway, so the, the large spatial scale of Cyber Southwest and the lack of local scale precision make it ideal for asking and answering questions about large regions. Um, but importantly, uh, this lack of location precision also makes it suitable for sharing over the internet. <clears throat> All right, so there are a handful of detours in this talk, and this is the first. Um, and really, and maybe this is almost kind of a, a thesis statement uh, for my talk tonight. Um, so preservation archaeology, sort of per the figure on the right here, um, is a central theme of most of our work at Archaeology Southwest, um, but it has a somewhat less concrete relationship to the data generated during research. Um, Seems like a no-brainer uh, that the preservation and use of data is important, but to be honest, it's not always been common practice in the discipline. Um, basically, I want to make the case that archaeologists must treat data with the same or better care that we treat sites and artifacts. Um, this is particularly true given the huge public investment in cultural resource management projects and that the data are an important, if not the main output of that work. Importantly though, uh, preservation of data does not mean just archiving the results of field projects in a museum or library. It means keeping it alive and useful for traditional owners and other stakeholders, which I think you know, we at Archaeology Southwest would say essentially the same thing for our more visible site and landscape preservation efforts. So yeah, um, what I'm talking about now is just a slight twist on a theme that pervades our work here at Archaeology Southwest. Um, for us, this work is values driven, and I mean that in the sense outlined by John Welch in a cafe presentation a couple of months ago. Um, whether it's a site or a landscape or you know bits of data in the computer, this information about the past is important for our diverse partners. Um, and while research is an important Cyber Southwest mission, we recognize there are other needs that this platform can contribute to. Um, so for example, perhaps site stewardship um, or working where it makes sense with tribes regarding better practices for naming of sites or artifact types. 
All right, so back to something of a regular flow for this presentation. Um, tonight's talk is not about cool results from research, sorry. Um, it's more about one of our tools for doing research. Um, and really, whether you knew it or not, um, you've been seeing maps generated by the Cyber Southwest app or research utilizing the underlying database across many of the talks you've seen in this season of Archaeology Cafes. Um, so this is a screenshot from Chris Castledean's talk uh, last fall. <clears throat> All right, so just to back up a little bit, um, a little bit of my, like the perspective on where I was coming to this from. Um, Bill mentioned this earlier, but I definitely got my, got my start doing more traditional archaeology. Um, but when I was in grad school, I drifted into computational modeling, um, did a lot of simulation work, um, and then finally ended up working for a few years in high performance computing. Um, and that was all before circling back to archaeology just two, three years ago. Um, but in that high performance computing phase of my life, I got to know several projects dealing with like seriously big data. So think genomics or meteorological modeling. Um, and so I come back to archaeology and folks are talking about big data. And I'm like, I don't know, essentially rolling my eyes. Uh, I mean, like Cyber Southwest is pretty big for an archaeology database, but um, researchers in big data are crunching more bits per second than are in, a, in our entire database. Um, but importantly, like there's a lot more to this idea of big data than just size. And our databases in archaeology and certainly what we're working with for Cyber Southwest, they're incredibly complicated um, compared to the bigger but simpler databases. Um, so for example, this really busy figure on the screen is what's called an entity relationship model. Um, and it's what guides the development of our database uh, that underlies Cyber Southwest. All right, and so that complexity has pushed us to adopt new and better tools to manage Cyber Southwest. Um, and so it's that that I'm going to describe over the next few minutes. <clears throat> sort of as a quick aside, uh, one of the things that's really struck me about this project day to day is what I guess I would call scale whiplash. Um, you know, be going from small, talking about the smallest data point you know, a single shirt um, on up to the whole region or a thousand year time span. Um, I was recently discussing with a colleague what to call a single obsidian artifact. Um, and then in the next hour um, with a different colleague discussing on whether a download limit of 10,000 rows of data would be enough for most users of Cyber Southwest. So, um, I mean, <laughs> is essentially is exactly what databases are for, but like it's still a little bit wild to live that in negotiated day to day. Um, all right, so take a quick look here at the kinds of things that are currently available in Cyber Southwest through the web application. Um, it's worth noting that everything currently available online is summarized at the site level. Um, so we're not talking about individual features or excavation units or households or anything like that. Um, and I'll be coming back to that later, but keep in mind, everything we've got right now is summarized at the site. Um, we've got ceramic data from many of these sites. Um, it's organized by wares and types and counts. Um, and we have available a master list of essentially thousands of types and wares following a set style guide for naming conventions. And that's something that we're working on making available to, uh, to folks doing ceramic analysis uh, around the Southwest if they want to sort of ease the process of integrating their data with ours. Um, we also have thousands of obsidian records um, with all the artifacts that we're currently making available sourced by X-ray fluorescence spectrometry. Um, 
And we are also adding uh, public architecture to the database. So those include things like Hoak on ball courts, or we've got great houses, great kivas. So all of that um, is in the database now. <clears throat> Detour number two. Um, all right, so quick shout out here, um, mainly because I couldn't think of where to put it. So I just dropped it in the middle of the talk. Um, of course, a lot of people have been involved in developing Cyber Southwest over the years, uh, and really dozens. Um, so I could do something like call out the principal investigators here, um, or the grad students. Um, our partners in the CRM world, um, some of our volunteer core, um, but instead because of a ton of work over the last six months, um, I just wanted to make a special shout out to two of our volunteers, uh, this is Catherine Serino and Jay Smith. Um, it's an incredible amount of tedious work collecting ceramic data for sites in the Southern Southwest, um, including a lot of Hoacom sites. Um, cleaning up ceramic type lists um, and documenting the Robinson collection. And for real, like keeping up with Catherine Serino is, is I mean, it keeps me busy. So thanks for that work. It's hugely appreciated. <clears throat> all right, back on track. Um, how is it all organized? Um, we use what is called a graph database. Um, specifically a database platform called Neo4j. Um, personally, would love to discuss this in great detail. Um, it's really cool, but was advised not to go too deep here. So yeah, um, just a few key points on, on what this is and how it works. Um, when I say graph for graph database, um, it's basically another word for network um, with the main idea that all of the data points are stored as nodes in relationships and they're all interconnected in a big, very messy network. Um, like I said, not going to go into any depth here how that works, but it's a great and elegant way of organizing a complicated data model like we're working with for this project. Um, it's very different from a stack of spreadsheets or better known relational databases. Um, it's very useful for us because it is much more flexible than traditional ways of organizing this information. So this image uh, I've got on the screen right now shows how the ceramic data for Romero Ruin, which is just north of Tucson, how they're organized in our database. Um, to quickly explain what the heck it is you're looking at. Um, so these, uh, the blue dot in the center um, represents the site itself, Romero Ruin. Um, the pink dots with numbers in them represent the counts of ceramics, which are connected to green and gray dots, which are the ceramic types and wares. Um, and then the yellow dots sort of on the edge of this figure, they represent the original sources or the references for this data, like basically where it came from. Um, and all of these are connected by the little relationship lines. And so um, the ceramic count is connected to the site and that same ceramic count is connected to a type and a where and a source. Um, so hopefully that's enough to get a bit of an image of how this is all hooked up. <clears throat> All right, so I wanted to throw in a quick nod to some recent uses of Cyber Southwest and its predecessors. Um, this came up once already, but uh, Scott Ingram's use of the Coalescent Communities database, which is sort of one of the one of the databases at the core of Cyber Southwest. Um, it came up in the uh, cafe last month with Karen Schulmeyer. Um, a couple of pretty recent, uh, fairly um, high visibility papers have come out, um, one from Nick Gautier, um, another from Michelle Hegman and her collaborators. Um, if you're interested in checking out these papers, um, I'd 
basically send you to the Archaeology Southwest blog. Um, we've got links, uh, direct links to these articles there. Um, and really, this body of work is growing, and we expect it to grow fast. Um, there are several projects in the works. Um, and really, like right now, we've got right around 230 registered active users on Cyber Southwest. Um, we're averaging about 3,000 hits per month on the site. So we're definitely getting some traffic. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to take another look at the main application with sort of an eye on how to find what you're looking for. Um, this is not going to be a tutorial, but I still wanted to point a few things out about how it works. Um, <clears throat> so we've got this explore tab that is there to help you find sites and data sets. Um, if you're going into Cyber Southwest and you already know the site name or site number that you're looking for, um, easy enough, you can just search for that. Um, but if you're just uh, more you know, exploring around and trying to find sites, um, you can also search to find those sites of interest by geographic area. Um, as in, basically, you can draw your own shapes on the map. Um, or you can use built-in shapes like political boundaries um, if you wanted to just do a county. Um, or you can do um, sort of more natural boundaries like watersheds. Um, so the figure that I've got on the screen right now is, oh, I think it's the Middle Gila Hydrological Unit or something to that effect. Um, or, all right, uh, instead of just searching by shapes on maps, you can also search by what was found at that site. And so you can search for artifact types that were present on the site or by public architecture. <clears throat> um, sort of an alternate way into this uh, data set. Um, you can also search to find artifact types of interest. Um, and importantly, this returns heat maps of type distributions, not the sites themselves. Um, and really, you've probably seen these heat maps in my coworkers' presentations. Um, a couple of them really uh, enjoy using these, and um, certainly they're good for visualizing sort of where where types are. Um, so, for example, this image that's up on the screen is all of the uh, what is it, Roosevelt Redwares? Um, and I probably, you know, had I been thinking like somebody who was doing a presentation for the public would have included a picture of what a Roosevelt Redware looks like, but instead what we've got is the map. So there you go. Um, all right, so once you've identified a site of interest, um, Here's what you get when you open that site record. Um, this one is for Whiptail Ruin. Um, get a little general information about the geography. Um, you get some date ranges, and then you get room counts, and then a table that has got modeled temporal allocations of those rooms. So basically how many of those rooms we think were occupied at a given time window. Importantly, um, what you don't get, and I hinted at this earlier, <clears throat> basically in no circumstances are the actual site locations displayed. Everything is masked. Um, it's basically been jittered just a little bit. Um, we think it is unlikely to matter for most research questions at the right scale for a database like Cyber Southwest. Um, we do have a tiered access that allows certain approved researchers to a less mass version of the database, but even approved researchers aren't getting the precise site locations. Um, and basically, to make this information available online, we simply cannot post sensitive site locations. And so that's a compromise that we've, we've made. Um, and just the example on the screen is for uh, Pueblo Grande in Phoenix, um, which the red arrow is pointing to where that site is. Um, 
felt like it might be okay to include that in the presentation since there is a museum there. It's not like that's a um, unknown site, um, but the blue arrow pointing to a blue dot shows just um, how much we have moved the location for that site over in our database. <clears throat> All right, detour number three. Um, Wanted to talk just for a second about why the room count allocation that I mentioned oh, a couple slides ago um, is such a cool thing uh, for us doing research on, on the Southwest. Um, and basically, strictly speaking, in Cyber Southwest, we have a site record and we have ceramics from that site. And we know roughly the time range that the site was occupied. And if we're lucky, we know how many rooms were at that site. Um, but essentially by looking at the ceramic types present on the site and using the curves underlying an analysis called the uniform probability density analysis, we can model the growth of that site and get an idea of how much of the site was occupied at any given time. Um, and really why that's great is because it allows us to do reconstruction of like regional demography, um, which is certainly a topic of interest um, to researchers here at Archaeology Southwest. All right, so back uh, to what you do get from a site record. <clears throat> um, so you can get ceramic and obsidian data um, broken out by the original references. Um, this uh, got a couple of tables, both of obsidian and ceramic shown on the screen right now. Um, what I want you to notice on this is that um, there is a download button with each of these tables. Um, and so you can drop these records into your preferred analysis software or um, Basically, we have a growing analysis toolkit available on the site itself. And so um, sort of just got one example of what this looks like in the application. Um, and then, you know, referring again to that uniform prob probability density analysis. Um, and, you know, what happens when you run this uh, is you just have to work through a couple of pull down menus. Um, there will be some widgets that pop up to help you make sure that you've got the the data that you're interested in using for the analysis. And then you'll end up getting outputs of tables um, with stats. Uh, you'll also get these plots and all of that is downloadable and um, and I mean, basically it's there for you to go play with. Um, one of the tools that I'm super excited about that I mean, we've been working on for a while and really just pushed live to the site a couple of weeks ago is a social network analysis toolkit. Um, and basically what this allows you to do is uh, basically build similarity matrices between sites based on what's in their decorated pottery assemblages um, and then um, build these networks of just how connected those sites were. Um, pretty cool. Um, this is the sort of thing that previously would have been quite a project to pull this data off of a, you know, out of a database um, to run the uh, various uh, adjacency similarity matrices and then um, load it into a separate uh, network analysis toolkit. And then from there, you would have to put it onto an actual map. Um, it's tedious. I spent a lot of time doing that years ago. Um, and now we've made it so that all that is available right on the site here. Um, with one little caveat here that like on some level, we provide these tools, um, but what you do with them is it's up to you. Um, so you may want to make sure you know what the uniform probability density analysis or social network analysis are and why you would use them before you just start mashing buttons. But you know, if you're a button pusher, go go see what sorts of damage you can do. <clears throat> 
All right, so I'm gonna set up sort of a mirror image of my earlier question. Um, you know, with the tools and data that I've described, um, are you starting to get any ideas of the kinds of questions that might be of interest? And I don't know, think about that. Otherwise, I'm basically gonna say that that was our quick look at where Cyber Southwest is now. And I'm gonna do a little pivot to talking about what is next for the project. <clears throat> All right, so, I mean, in my notes, I have this in all capital letters, but basically it is so much more data. Um, we're going to be adding projects from all over the Southwest um, with partners in cultural resource management, um, academic partners, agencies, uh, you name it, we're bringing them in and um, we're going to be adding to our already large database with a, a ton of new projects. Um, Importantly, we're making a shift away from just organizing these data at the site level. Um, we're going for higher resolution. Um, and even more specifically, we're going to be talking about households. Um, in a lot of ways, like organizing this kind of information in terms of, you know, essentially demography and economics, because we're talking about things like pottery, um, at the uh, household levels gives us a lot of parallels to the modern US census. And I um, think that there's a really cool opportunity if we if we can get that kind of resolution um, to not only do cool archaeology, but perhaps we can start bringing in some researchers from adjacent social sciences um, who are, are used to thinking at that kind of level. <clears throat> We're planning to do uh, social networks and more of them again, um, but more nuanced. Um, Basically, by you get this, you know, organizing at this household level, we'll be able to do much higher temporal resolution. Um, and also, and this is of particular interest to me, um, we may be able to look at things like distribution networks within settlements or subregions. Um, and really, like, we may be able to start looking at things like specialized production by households within sites. Okay, also, we're working on assembling a tribal work group to advise us on the future development of Cyber Southwest. Um, Archaeology Southwest recently received a private donation to launch the development of a tribal work group. Um, in addition, our current grant proposal, the National Science Foundation, would provide three years uh, more funding for an expanded tribal work group. Um, we want to keep the goal setting for this group as much as possible in the hands of the tribal participants. Um, mainly, I'm bringing it up here just to let you all know that we are working on it. All right, just a few more thoughts here and I'll wrap up. Um, wanted to show the list of our current NSF support. Um, I've learned um, in earlier presentations and in other conferences and contexts that they tend to notice if you don't credit them. Um, I also wanted to do a quick shout out to um, sort of my main partner day to day working on this project. Um, his name is Andre Takagi and he is um, he's basically the one responsible for making the site work. Um, he, he does a lot of the technical stuff. Um, easy way to think about this is I'm largely responsible for building and managing the database. And then he is the one that, um, that makes the site work that you all have access to. <clears throat> all right. So with Cyber Southwest, we support research within Archaeology Southwest. And, and with our partnering institutions. Um, but I mean, also we're available to researchers and educators and the general public all around the world. Um, it's free, uh, registration is pretty painless. I mean, if you have an email address, which 
since you're registered for this cafe, you probably have an email address. Um, you can sign up. Um, really, anyone listening tonight is totally qualified to see if they can answer their questions using Cyber Southwest. Um, I mean, Cyber Southwest fills really a critical need for a living, growing research database that facilitates broad access to information in an infrastructure that is ready for exploratory and explanatory research. All right, one last time I'm circling around to the original question, which was what tools do you need? Any new thoughts on this? Um, maybe this presentation got you thinking about new tools or questions, or maybe even features for Cyber Southwest that might be useful for your work. Um, I mean, we think that Cyber Southwest is an important implementation of preservation archeology. span um, and really an important part of the toolkit for doing research and really archeology span more broadly in terms of engagement with you know, descendant communities and other stakeholders in the coming decades. And, and really with that, I have just one last comment and that is that I really like kind of personally want to invite you to check it out. Um, any questions submitted through the Cyber Southwest site, um, there's a contact link there will end up in my inbox if you want to contact me directly. And with that, just uh, one last thanks for your attention. And I'm going to go ahead and turn this back over to Linda for um, any follow-up questions that people might have. You can leave that screen up for a while if you want, Josh. Sure, I'll do that. Um, I guess I'm visible, great. Um, before I get to the questions, did, did I miss, did I miss it? How would somebody sign up to use Cyber Southwest? Ah, okay. So we're all excited. We all want to join now. Right. What do we do? What do we do? I mean, I mean, if you go to uh, go to the site and um, there's a login button, and if you hit the login button, but you have not actually been to the site, um, it redirects you to a registration page, and which just asks a few simple questions, um, and you'll just need to basically confirm that you're not a robot. And you're welcome in. Um, what's, this, but, what's the actual site address? Oh, this is really tricky. Um, ah. www.cybersouthwest.org. Yeah. I know you're there all the time, so you it's hard for you to believe right. it. Right. Somebody no. might not know what I, it is, but thank you. No, I thought that. I don't have to type it up much because it's in every browser window that I've got. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, where to start with some questions? Let's see. We got several questions. Um, <clears throat> one of the questions was, um, "What is the?" And you you touch on this a little bit. What is the process for adding new research and data into the database? Is this is it funneled through Archaeology Southwest? Um, do researchers request that their data be included, or do you like seek out new data? It's How are you getting data? Yeah, so it's a little bit of all that. Okay. Um, and so I, um, in general, we don't, like, there's no magic behind the integrating of other people's data into our, our database. Like, um, I would have to sit down with somebody, you know, virtually or however we end up doing it. And we just have a lot of work making sure that say the pottery types that they have used um, map onto our pottery types um, and just come up with those kinds of concordance or ontologies. There's a lot of you know fancy words you can use to talk about that, but basically we just need to make sure that what they've got will play nice with what we've got. And that's a lot of work. Um, but um, yeah, I know that we do a lot of outreach trying to target soft spots in our database. And, um, and then also we're working with, particularly with CRM, uh, cultural resource management outfits that have an awful lot of this data, because if we can, oftentimes if we can figure out the workflow for one of their projects, it will work for all of their projects. And so, um, so that's kind of a way to uh, sort of open the fire hose and start getting a lot more um, in. But um, yeah, mostly like 
there's there's at present no like clever way just to go to the site and drop your your database in and have magic happen it's mm -hmm. it's fairly tedious work but that's what we do a couple folk have um brought up the idea or and and or question about um is it possible to or does it provide a photo of an object <clears throat> and um yeah like if it, will they return digital records with photos and right bytes? so a couple questions around that yeah, so far we have resisted that. Um, I, it, it's, it may be something that happens in the future. Um, more likely, the direction we're going to be going um, is, for example, including links on our page that would point to how oh, the Museum of Northern Arizona has a great um, image archive for pottery types. And so you would be able to click on that pottery type from our site and jump right out to that external source. Um, so that would be one way we could manage that. Um, also in the future, there may be things like PDFs of site plans, you know, basically what the map of what the site looks like, but, um, but um, the, you know, real talk or like the real answer right now is we're not doing images, um, but we would like to get there. Great, great. Well, one of your early questions you were talking about, I think, like, categories of data or things that you might like to manipulate. And I just thought I'd share that um, one of our viewers, um, you know, threw out the idea of tree ring data and botanical samples. Yeah, I think, yeah, that would be terrific. Um, it's definitely an interest of mine to get more of you know, essentially what would be ecological data, mm -hmm. um, you know, and that's relevant to that. But like those, the, you know, the ecology, the context that these people were, were living in was incredibly important to how they they went about their lives. And I think that if we want you know, to sort of have a cyber Southwest that lives up to its name, we've got to start bringing in um, some of those, you know, closely related data categories. Sure. Yeah, sure. Great. A couple of people have also asked um, about the analyses that you've got there. Like, is there like a FAQ that might so, help people figure out how to use it or like a summary of what these tools do? Yeah, okay. So <laughs> some of it is very well documented and some of it is a work in progress. Okay. Um, we're, we're in a phase where we're kind of adding things as fast as we can and then trying to uh, backfill some of that uh, supporting documentation as we're able. Um, all those analyses have um, links that kick out to, for example, the original paper where they, uh, you know, where that stuff was uh, from. And we also have a number of analyses where, um, say, we jump users out to um, uh, web page that Matt Peoples created that has a bunch of R scripts. Um, so, and basically a lot of this is very well documented. Um, some of it you might get kicked off of our site onto a partner's site to get that, uh, mm -hmm. get that documentation. But um, we've, we've tried to uh, steer people as well as, as we can while still building out the toolkit. Mm -hmm. uh, Bruce Hilpert asks, <laughs> Bruce is a buddy, I can throw his name out. Um, he wants to know if the room data includes residential or solely public architecture. All right, so the, most of the room data um, is residential rooms. Um, so uh, the public architecture is kind of a separate thing. Um, so if, uh, yeah, if we've got uh, a Pueblo that's got, you know, 120 rooms on it or something like that, like we're, we're basically talking about, you know, either the counted or best estimate of rooms that, uh, that researchers have recorded when they visited those sites. Um, I think there might be a couple of questions here, but uh, this is a really, I think a really important one maybe to explore a little bit further is does, does the database include information from tribal lands? 
and how many tribes are participating um, or are they right now? So, and I think this ties in, there was a question about who are stakeholders and- Right, yeah, okay. So uh, these are all um, somewhat sticky questions. Yeah. Um, there, there are some sites in our database that are on tribal lands. Um, not a lot, um, but it is basically like we have ported, you know, we, we've included a bunch of earlier databases in the building of this thing. And if, if, those, um, if those databases had it, um, a lot of times we are including it. Um, as with everything, we are not including any of the like sensitive site location information. So all that is, of course, still um, still masked. Um, a lot of the tribal outreach um, is going to be really more fully developed as we put together this work group that I talked about in the last couple minutes of the presentation. Um, the um, and to date, uh, again, a lot of this project was pursued and really with a lot of academic partners and a lot of CRM partners. And, and to be honest, like we could have done better working with descendant communities and we're eh, like, basically we, we can and will do better. And so that's a big part of what the, the plan going forward is. Thank you, thank you. Um, following up on your household thing, just uh, talking about dream worlds in terms of data one might like. Uh, comment here, for thinking about the emphasis on households, I'd like to see data regarding bond and abutment patterns in Pueblo mm -hmm. room blocks. I doubt such detail is often available. Are you guys dreaming about it? Oh, I, um, I that's a fine idea. Um, <laughs> and so I mean, one of the, the really I mean, kind of nice things about this um, graph database structure, this infrastructure that I described during this talk is that um, it's really well suited for adding information where we have it. Um, and so um, if we did have a site where we needed to add, um, you know, details about, you know, the, say the bonding and abutting of rooms, things like that. Um, I think we'd actually be well positioned to implement that and make it available. Um, but yeah, I'd say uh, on the broader scale of say the South, you know, the Southwest, um, that, that fine of detail is not something we've talked a lot about, but I think we're well positioned to do it if we uh, happen into a situation where, where we can do it. Yeah. Uh, what about rock art? Is rock art going in? Yeah, so that's, that's another thing that is on the to-do list. Um, it's a little bit, um, it's basically part of this next phase of going to finer scale. Um, and part of that is because like when you think about rock art, like when you aren't thinking about sites in the same way as you are residential sites. Yeah. And so much of this database in the past was basically built on this idea of, you know, a 12 room or larger residential site or something like that. And that's just not what rock art is. And so we're, we're needing to take this cool database structure and modify it so that we can handle the, uh, kinds of you know spatial and you know all the various categorization all, all the work that you would need to do to um get that rock art in the database and we will um we'll be doing that um been you know basically working um with aaron wright and some of his crew to start adding a bunch of that stuff in the yeah it's a relatively near to midterm so with, but the, the details of how that's going to happen is still kind of to be determined. Great, great. Just a couple other questions before we wrap up. If you got a minute or two, we still have a little bit of time. But sure. I think these two are sort of related, but they might not be. But anyway, um, 
folk are asking about, are there other big databases covering the Southwest and do we coordinate and standardize data fields between databases? And maybe it's a different question, but um, what are our standards for accuracy in general, like of data? Mm -hmm. All right, well. Can I address that a little? <laughs> oh boy, no. Um... All right, so so there are I mean, actually a handful of large databases that you know are in the Southwest and beyond. Um, you know, one that really comes to top of mind um, is a project by uh, Digital Antiquity out of Arizona State University called TDAR. Um, I would guess a lot of our folks on the uh, on the cafe tonight are at least passingly familiar with it but it's basically an archive of um, reports and data and even images from sites really all over the world but since they're based in the southwest they've put a lot of effort into collecting those materials mm -hmm. um, it's a great archive. Um, I spent some time working there as a graduate student. Um, what it is not it, at this point is like a single integrated database where you can do the kinds of um, you know, analyses right, right on the site that we do here. So it's, it's an important archive. Um, it's just in a slightly different lane from what we're doing. Um, similarly, um, a good example of a state managed site database is called AsSite. Um, and that is a big site database that um, basically keeps track of where and what all the sites are um, and where research projects like CRM projects have happened in Arizona, um, but also is not at all suited for the kinds of analyses that you know the research and the other questions that i've talked about tonight um, i think the data interoperability and just getting you know data sets to play nice together um, that's probably what the rest of my career is going to be focused on but um like it really it's um it's a big question um and i think uh a, there are a bunch of us working on it from different angles, and I really wouldn't be surprised if going forward, yeah, partnerships with outfits like TDAR and similar sorts of things that will help us um, help us to continue developing this in the direction it needs to go. Great, great. Well, I mean, it's seven o'clock, so we probably should wrap up. Um, Thank you very much, Josh. Um, yep. I wanted to let everybody know that if your questions didn't get answered or didn't get answered adequately, you can you know, throw them in the Q&A again or email Josh. And um, we will post um, some answers to maybe some of the questions that we didn't get to answer or things that seemed like they might be a little more complicated. We'll um, put together some answers to that and put it on the extended content on our website. And if you're registered for this uh, cafe will you'll get an email out when that's ready that says hey thanks for coming and josh has answered some more questions go to our website so that's how we'll wrap everything up so and i think that's about it but i need to ask bill if he wants to come back late at night from pennsylvania and wrap us up <laughs> thank you linda thank you josh for yeah. uh, excellent uh, story of a about a complicated topic so much appreciated so we're getting toward the end of the year, as I mentioned in uh, the introduction, uh, this was penultimate, next time is ultimate. Um, and it's going to be uh, Samuel Fayant, Fayant uh, fr who's from the Cultural Affairs Office of the Tone Autumn Nation and myself um, presenting the next time around. And we've actually been focusing on a pottery type that Emil Howery, when he arrived at the Arizona State Museum back in the late 30s, uh, started to document out on the, the reservation and across the Southern Southwest. So going back um, paying attention to some uh, things with some new technology brought to it by Mary Onby, Jim Heike, uh, Sarah Herr. So, and I've been just having a great time out on the Tohono Autumn Reservation with Samuel. Um, 
re relocating sites, um, seeing what they look like today. And so we're going to talk about cells red pottery as a marker for Tonawatam identity in late prehistoric time, pre Hispanic times. And uh, bring some ethnographic and archaeological data together to uh, figure out or at least have some ideas about uh, try to answer the question, why is all of the pottery from the San Pedro over to Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument have the same sand temper in it? So, and why does that sand temper come from the base of Baba Kivri Peak, the Don Autumn Sacred Mountain? So pretty cool stuff. Um, they don't usually let me out of the office and I've been having a great time. So I look forward to uh, May 4th. So, and uh, we'll be back for the, the last of the year. So All thanks right. so much for coming tonight. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye now.